Good evening, Internet. Um, as mentioned earlier, I was going to do a board game episode this week, and, well, that's what I'm going to do. Um, now, for those of you that are less aware, hello, listen. I did not even stage this. That's how awesome my cats are. They've been chattering at the birds immediately outside. Um, some of you think of board games as that thing that you do when you have yourself and either family or group of friends, usually family, and the power goes out and you have no idea what to do. So you dig out board, family board games in the closet and everybody, really, they only ever want to play them when the power's out. That's not the case for me. I'm actually a great big fan of board games, and I think a lot of people would be as well if they were more familiar with things that weren't just Monopoly, Clue, and Life. Oh dear, the game of life. Um, today, I wanted to show you one of my favorite games. Uh, it's not my absolute favorite, but it's definitely up there. And, well, it's a little more picturesque than some of the other games that I play. Not to mention, well, it fit on the table. See, I don't even need to try to get my cats to be in these videos. They just naturally appear. I need to get up as soon. So, um, today I wanted to show you, as I said, one of my favorite games. Uh, this is... Lords of Waterdeep. I'm hoping this is visible because I can't see what the camera is looking at. Uh, Lords of Waterdeep is what's called a worker placement game. If you are familiar with board games and you have heard of games such as Agricola or Puerto Rico or games like that, this is a... I can't really call it exactly the same in style, but the idea is that you place your workers in different spots of the board. So, allow me to show you what I mean. So, Lords of Waterdeep is a D&D based board game. Whoa, it's a board! And I'm getting better with my tripod. Um, Lords of Waterdeep is a D&D based board game. Hi! Um, but what I mean by D&D based is that its theme is D&D. So you don't really need to know how to play D&D or anything like that. It doesn't even use any D&D rules or really any form of real role-playing. The idea behind the game is that this is a fantasy setting. So, being in a fantasy setting, you have, rather than, you know, uranium, steel, aluminum, resources like that, you instead have wizards. Oh, let me do this so I can actually see where I'm doing this. So, a wizard. A rogue. A cleric. A cat that's not supposed to be on the table. Zone, get down. It's obviously a vital resource. A fighter. And money. Um, money comes in either ones. Kind of looks like a cheese it with hole in it. Or fives. Looks like a moon. Hello, moon. So, um, these are your resources in this game. Um, the idea is that you want to collect resources in order to be able to allow you to complete quests and other ways of getting points. Just like many other games, the idea of the game is the most number of points at the end of the game wins. Um, as you can see toward the top here, and really all around the board is a score track. The idea being is that you can keep track of your score throughout the game. Um, so, the point of the game is that you are one of the mythical da, 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 lords of Waterdeep. The lord of Waterdeep is, allow me to bring this down a little bit so you can see the score area, or not score area, play area. Um, this is actually very similar to how this would be set up, say, mid-game. This is not a beginning game thing. I apologize for the rockiness. Um, you are one of the mythical lords of Waterdeep. Waterdeep is a city of spies and intrigue, and really nobody knows what's going on, not even the other people partaking in the efforts of maintaining the city. Um, so you are one of the secret lords of Waterdeep. When you start play, each player starts with one of these lord cards. It is face down under the player mat. Um, I believe you can read that, I think. Me move this down a little bit. I apologize for any weird vibrations. And yes, you can hear my cats playing around with their toys. 
I think that will do. So, um, you are one of the mythical lords of Waterdeep. As it says on the card, you place it face down underneath the mat, player mat. You are allowed to see who you are. In this case, we are Brienne Brindaith, a widow of a crime boss who is a lord of Waterdeep, or who is also a lord of Waterdeep. Brienne has close ties to the wizard, that guy, and a member of the city's social elite. So each of the lords have something like this. Um... In the base game, all but one of the lords have something identical of, at the end of the game, you score four points, that's what that symbol is, for each bleh and bleh quest that you have completed. In this case, it's Arcana and Skullduggery. As you can see from these quests, these are your active quests. Um, you have some Skullduggery quests and an Arcana quest. There are five different types of quests total in the game. Uh, Skullduggery, Arcana... Commerce, Piety, and Warfare, which this particular character does not have available. Um, you have your Tavern Area. Your Tavern Area holds your resources, which include Money and Adventurers. In this case, I have, let's see, that would be 10 Money and 4 Adventurers. I'm pretty well set up right now. Um, like I said, this is set up as though it's mid-game, just because it looks more interesting. You have your Completed Quests here. Let's see there, it says Completed Quests. Uh, these are the quests that the, the player obviously completed earlier. You also have completed plot quests that are over here. A plot quest is a quest that has an ongoing effect of some variety. So, for instance, in this case, let's see, can I get this readable? Yeah, that's totally readable. Um, whenever I take an action that provides any money, I also gain a rogue. So, whenever I start gaining money, I gain rogues. It's a very nice plot quest. Um, there are a fair number of quests in the game. Let me move this away from the play area for a moment go back up to the board hmm i'm gonna need to roll this back up aren't i sorry i'm still getting used to the tripod really this is an excuse in getting better with my tripod if i was better at editing you know where i had editing software that didn't desynchronize the audio for absolutely no reason whatsoever i would totally be fixing this in post-production i apologize um do, 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 do. More vibrations, and let's aim this slightly better. So, um, the play area consists of different locations that you can enter. Hi! Um, each of these little figures, you know, I'll just bring one closer to the camera so it's a little bit easier to see. Each of these figures indicates it's a spot that you can go. You can place a worker or in this case, you place one of your tokens. I can't remember what the actual title for this is in the game. Uh, they're meeple. Anyway, um, the idea is that you take your turn by placing one of your tokens onto any of the squares that have that little symbol. Um, I'll get to what's, uh, what's different about these in a moment, but the base squares include an area that gains you two fighters, an area that gains you two rogues, an area that gains you one cleric, an area that gains you one wizard, area that gains you four money. These are all special areas, and an area that gains you a quest of some variety. Quests are the things that I had down below. Um, quests are what give you victory points, like for instance this quest. I can totally see if I do it like this. Uh, this quest gains you eight victory points and you take an additional quest. It, however, requires two clerics and a fighter. What this means is that you need to have two clerics and a fighter in order to complete the quest. When you do complete the quest, you remove those characters from the game. Um, there are, on the board, four quests displayed at any one time. Um, there are also buildings. Buildings are what you see over on the left here. These are buildings that have already been built. Down here are buildings that have not been built yet that are available for purchase. So, for instance, if I wanted to purchase a building, I would go down to the Builder's Hall, which says choose one building and pay its cost and put it into play. Um, each of these buildings have a benefit of some variety. Uh, they have a benefit, initial benefit, which are these things stacked up here. These are victory points. So if I were to buy the caravan court, yes, that is, does say caravan court, I would immediately gain three victory points. Three victory points for four money is a good exchange, by the way. Um, I would also be able to play this and put one of these token things on it. Um, the tokens tend to 
indicate who owns it. Uh, in my case, since I am apparently playing the Harpers, as usual, because my favorite color is green, um, I would put the Harpers token next to it. Um, from there, the buildings serve one of two purposes. Hi again. Um, one, somebody going onto the building gains what it says. So, for instance, if somebody were to visit the Tower of Luck, which is owned by the player that's black in this case, or uh, do, 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 the City Guard is the black player, um, they would gain a cleric and two rogues. However, you notice what down here where it says the owner gains something? Well, the owner gains this. So in other words, if since this is owned by the city guards, if I were to visit this building as green or the Harpers, yep, that's totally visible, um, I would be gaining two rogues and a cleric, and the city guard can gain either a cleric or a rogue. On the other hand, if I were to, say, go to this building, um, this is New Alum. This is owned by me. If I were to go to this building, I would gain two rogues and a wizard. I do not, however, gain the owner bonus. Totally helps if I move this up. I apologize. I can't see the camera usually, so things are a little weird. Um, the owner bonus is only gained for other players going to that building, which means you're incentivizing building buildings that other people benefit from. And that's one of the core interesting facts about this game is that you are perpetually doing things not directly to screw people over. Usually there are some things that are there to screw people over, but you're also doing things to help other people with the idea that you're helping yourself more than other people. So for instance, I would build this building because I want to gain a bunch of wizards without having to do anything. I don't have to take my turn interacting with the spot in order to gain those resources and so on. Um, you have a certain number of actions per turn uh, in this case, I set this up as though it was a four-player game. As a result, you start with two actions per turn. On round five, you gain this extra figure for three actions per turn. Uh, there are ways of gaining an additional action beyond that. I'm not going to bother going into that. In general, you keep going. Um, these are the little victory point things that you put on top of the buildings that are not in play yet in order to incentivize people for taking them. Um, you keep going until you reach turn 8. At the end of turn 8, that's probably more visible. At the end of turn 8, that's the end of the game. At that point, you count up the points that you have um, from your lord. In this case, um, let's say I gain 4 points for each Arcana and Skullduggery quest. I need to move this down so you can actually see what I'm doing. Woohoo! So. Four points for each Arcana and Skulda request. Well, this is a Commerce quest, so no extra points from that. I have two Piety quests and Arcana quest under here. So all I would end up doing is gaining four additional points for having an Arcana quest. So the reason why these characters are hidden, that way players don't necessarily know how many points you have at the end of the game. Um, in addition, you would end up gaining points for each resource uh, for resources that you already have. For each of the adventurers, you would gain one point, and for each two money that you would have, you would gain one point. So if the game were to end right now, I would have nine points at the end, plus four for that one completed quest. Um, how do you complete quests, nobody asked? Well, on your turn, first thing you do is you interact with a spot, and then after you finish interacting with a spot, you can decide to complete a quest. So for instance... We'll say that I decide, I know this is going to be really hard for you to read, I decide to go visit Blackstaff Tower. Black's actually, we'll use something that you can see. I'm going to go to New Alum. New Alum, for those of you that don't remember, you gain two rogues and a wizard. I decide to visit New Alum, and I will gain two rogues and a wizard. So, I am gaining two rogues and a wizard. After I interact with the square, I can decide to complete a quest if I am able. Uh, in this case, I now have three rogues, two wizards, a fighter, and a cleric. That means that I can complete two different quests here. I can either complete the safeguard, the Arcade Mage, which costs a fighter, a rogue, a wizard, four money, and then I would gain four victory points and two wizards. Or alternately, I can study the Illusk Arch, 
Studying the Illicit Arc costs me a cleric and two wizards, and gains me eight victory points, and it is a plot quest that whenever I complete an additional arcana quest, I gain two additional victory points. Since I am playing a lord that needs, as you may remember, arcana and skull... There we go. Arcana and Skullduggery, I believe that I am going to complete the Arcana quest. So I would put this over here. I would spend my resources, which are two wizards and a cleric. And then it's completed. I would score eight points immediately. And yes, I know you can't read this up here. All it is says up at the top of the points. So... I currently have 14 points. This means I now have 22 points. And that would be my turn. Um, there are a couple of other things that go on. For instance, there are intrigue cards. Intrigue cards, um, this character happens to have two of them right over here. Intrigue cards are cards that you can play if you go to a certain spot in the game. And they do various effects. For instance... Uh, we we'll use this one as an example. Um, I can assassinate, which allow, uh, which requires all my opponents to remove a rogue from their tavern and return it to the supply. For each opponent that couldn't, I gain two money. So in other words, I can either play this at a time that all of my opponents have rogues that I want to get rid of so they can't complete quests as easily, or ultimately at a time where none of them have rogues, where I just gain a whole bunch of money for free. This quest, which apparently has jam on it, I need to clean that a little bit. Um, this quest allows me to focus. My camera decided to stop focusing for some reason. Ooh, this is already going on really long. Can you read? Why are you not focusing? There we go. Okay, so this quest costs... Two money, or not quest, um, intrigue card. I can choose a spot that a uh, current opponent's piece is on, and I can use that spot as though I went there. So, what that means is that normally, we'll say, for an example, um, player red is on the board. I have already gone to New Alum, way back here, that's totally not visible, um, and player red really wanted those two rogues and a wizard. So what the player could do is play the Bribe Agent card via going to Waterdeep Harbor. Waterdeep Harbor's symbol says Play Intrigue card. They play this card and then interact as though they had gone there. Uh, a lot of Intrigue cards do various effects like that. The idea with Intrigue cards is that you're not boxed into having to do any particular action because they're not available. Normally, you cannot go on the same place more than once. So, for instance... If this was the case, and yellow wanted to go on one of those spots, they're SOL. Unless if they have a quest that allows them to do so, an intrigue card, or if there's a building that allows them to do so. Uh, all three exist in the game. The last thing I wanted to go over is turn order. So Castle Waterdeep is the last of the normal spots that I haven't mentioned. So there's this funny looking piece here. This is the crown. The crown indicates who goes first. Play order goes clockwise from the crown. Um, by visiting Castle Waterdeep, you gain the crown. What this means is that you are now first. Yeah, that's right. It's a game that you change the turn order on. Have fun with that. Um, it's a bit of a hallmark for Euro games. Euro games being, well, European in origin. It's more of a European in style. Look it up on the internet if you... Are curious. This is already running nearly 20 minutes or over 20 minutes now. Um, that's really about it for my quick synopsis. I really like Lords of Waterdeep, and it's not just because I'm extremely good at the game. I'm not. I'm actually terrible at worker placement games. This is the first game worker placement game that I've actually won, and I have utterly curb stumped people in this game even, but it's not routine. It's not regular. It's not something that I can say I always win at. You have no idea how important that is to me. And yeah, soon. <sighs> Silly kitty. So, enjoy internet. I will see you all Saturday. Bye. And 20.